Chapter One of A Yellow Journalist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. A Yellow Journalist by Miriam Michelson. Chapter One The Pollocksfin Story in which Miss Massey aimed to beat Mr. Thompson. As I stepped from the train, I came face to face with Ted Thompson of the Times record. He took off his hat with a rather sardonic smile. Everyone knows that Thompson doesn't consider a newspaper woman a foeman worthy of his steel. He said so often enough. So I bowed stiffly and resentingly and in my heart fearfully but this last, of course, he couldn't see, and I'd have died before letting him know it. Oh, to beat Thompson on a story. The Pollocksfin story, of course, Miss Massey? He asked, turning with me to walk up the main street leading to the hotel. Why, we must have come on the same train, I exclaimed irrelevantly, not daring to answer him. Yes, I was in the smoker. Both the news and the T.R. seem to have caught the contagion at the same time. The press and the Tribune will get it by tomorrow, and all the boys will be up here. But it's no use. I looked up at him inquiringly. Not a bit, he continued. This is my third trip after a Pollocksfin story. It'll be my third failure. But there is a story? Oh, of course there's a story. You won't be in town half an hour before you hear that Pollocksfin poisoned his brother-in-law, that he has Mrs. Chipchase hypnotized so that she signs anything he puts before her, that the girls, Mrs. Chipchase's stepdaughters, fear and hate him, that the Chipchase fortune is melting away in his hands, that he has a private hoard, and that Miss Stemple, the housekeeper... He paused and looked at me a moment. I wish I hadn't such a silly baby face. That Miss Stemple and he are dividing the property between them, with the exception of Mary Chipchase's own fortune, which State Senator Newberry, her guardian, you know, has invested for her. But when it comes to getting anybody to talk and to stand behind a single rumor, you're up against it. You've got to take your choice between being responsible for a libel suit or going back to the office empty-handed. Which will you choose, Miss Massey? It's your first out-of-town assignment, isn't it? I nodded. He waited. I don't know, I said at last slowly. I won't do either, if I can help it. He smiled again and lifted his hat. If I can be of any use, he said. But I thanked him stiffly and went into the hotel alone, hating him, hating him for being so shrewd for having such a reputation that it terrified one to be pitted against him, hating him for laughing at me, for patronizing me, for being so easy and carefree about his story, while, heart and soul, I was bound up in mine. It was ten o'clock when I walked up the hedge-lined path toward the chip-chase place. I strolled up casually, as a visitor might. That was because I was scared to death and wanted to appear at ease. The day may come when Rhoda Massey will condescend genteely to her work, like Mrs. Hilgard and some other newspaper women I know. But you must remember this was my first big detail away from the office. The big old chip-chase house faces the road rather haughtily. To me, a lone, small reporter, trembling in my boots, it looked insolent, forbidding, in spite of its being so badly in need of repair. So because I was terrified and wanted to cut and run, I jangled the old-fashioned bell as loud as I could, and then stood listening to my heartbeat, while mechanically I repeated to myself what McCabe, the news editor, had said when he handed my transportation. Whatever you hear, Miss Massey, and whatever you see, bear this one thing in mind. I know this story's true. I know it, but I don't dare to print it without knowing more. They'll deny it, of course. The chip-chases are the swells of their county. 
even if they have been going downhill ever since old Chipchase died and Pollocksfin got the upper hand. It's Pollocksfin you'll have to fight. He's Mrs. Chipchase's brother. She was the only decent one of the shiftless lot, and so long as her husband lived he kept her gang of disreputable relatives at arm's length. But at his death, Wells Pollocksfin stepped in. Senator Newberry, the girl's guardian, has tried more than once to dislodge him, but nothing will, except Rhoda Massey if she gets this story. Mind, it's no sense you're up against. During the past three years there isn't an ambitious reporter in town who hasn't heard of a Pollocksman story and tried to land it. Every deviltry on earth that man's been accused of by the country people up there, but the charges melt away before your eyes and every time they're downed Pollocksfin brings his sister and her stepdaughters to town, exhibits them at a theater or the opera to clinch the proof of his innocence and their good will, and then back they all go to live in seclusion at the old place, the House of Mystery. Thompson first called it that. Mary Chipchase's elopement the other day is absolutely the one Pollocksfin story that stuck, and that Pollocksfin gave it out himself is a sufficient reason for anybody who knows the man to dispute. What is it, miss, if you please? I jumped. So sudden was the interruption, so softly had the door opened behind me. Mr. Pollocksfin? I asked. I knew it was. That square, tanned, yet colorless face, with its coarse, thick, white hair beneath a skull cap, its thick-lipped, large, clean-shaven mouth and domineering eyes, was the same that I had seen Aiken in our art room, drawing from a portrait yesterday. "'My name is Pollocksvin,' he said. "'What a fine view one gets of the valley from here,' I commented lightly, turning as though to admire it while feebly I fenced for time. "'Very,' he dryly responded. "'It's well worth climbing up from town for,' I continued gaily. "'But I wasn't feeling very gay, I can tell you. "'I only wanted to gain time, even a moment, "'that something, anything in the world, might happen. "'And sure enough it did. "'A tall, white-faced woman with large, timid eyes "'and long, clasped hands came out into the hall behind him. "'I smiled at her over his shoulder, "'and a faint, wistful greeting came into her face.' "'I'm Miss Massey of the News, Mr. Pollocksfin, and Mrs. Chipchase,' I added, trying to include her. "'And I've come up here on the most absurd story. I hope you'll both pardon me, but what is one to do when one's news editor insists upon sending one on a wild goose chase?' For a moment I thought he was going to shut the door in my face, but the agitation of the lady behind him and a half-movement she made toward me, it must have been that made him change his mind. "'Come in,' he said, leading the way to an old-fashioned, high-ceilinged room on the right. "'Kindly, will you excuse Mrs. Chipchase?' he added with a significant look at her. "'She is not very well. This affair of Miss Chipchase's, Mary is her mother's favorite, and—' "'A denial from Mrs. Chipchase would be particularly effective.' I hazarded. Oh, I longed to get at that woman. I could see my story just trembling on her lips. But a hysterical cry came just then from Mrs. Chipchase. She put her hands to her throat, tried vainly for composure, then hurried from the room. You see, Mr. Pollocksfin was looking at me closely. Evidently he wanted to know how much I could really see. Poor lady! "'Perhaps when she feels better,' I suggested. "'Yes, a little later. "'Perhaps you can stay to lunch, Miss Massey, and afterward—' "'Why, thank you!' "'What a gracious villain it was!' "'And now for the story,' he said, "'settling himself snugly in a big armchair. "'What is the latest report for which I am indebted "'to a charming girl's presence?' "'Ooh!' I wasn't a charming girl. I wasn't a girl at all just then. I was only a reporter, a creature with eyes and ears and possessed by curiosity, and to be set back into my skirts that way made me tingle with distaste. It isn't so easy, 
I said slowly, trying to take his cue. To tell a gentleman to his face that, that, that he is a scoundrel, or that rumor says he is? No, it is not a nice task for a pretty little woman like you, but I'm used to it in a way. Whenever the beggars of the local press are out at elbows or down at the heel or in need of a dollar to keep drunk on, his face wasn't pleasant to look at just then. They turn their filthy imaginations loose on me in what they choose to call the house of mystery. It is for this reason that I never see a reporter from the village. But when a beautiful lady journalist comes all the way... Mr. Pollocksfin, I interrupted, how in the world do you suppose beautiful lady journalists get any work done if their heads are to be turned by compliments? The wonder is, he responded, that newspaper men can get any work done for looking at them. But you, Miss Massey, you can't have much serious work to do. A girl with a dimple and... I have serious work on hand just now, Mr. Pollocksfin, I said quickly. I have to ask you and Mrs. Chipchase some disagreeable questions. Was there a violent scene between you and Miss Chipchase Saturday last, the day of the elopement? Did you strike her, Miss Chipchase, with your cane? I looked at it now, a thick knob stick with a strong handle upon which his hands were clasped. And did she fall, crying, Never, never, not even for her sake, you could kill me first? And as soon as Mr. Newberry comes back, I'll expose you? Yes, I will this time if I die for it? I was watching him now. His hands, upon which his broad chin rested, may have gripped the handle of his cane tighter, but his heavy, sallow face did not move a muscle. There wasn't the smallest change of expression about the strong black eyes or large-lipped mouth. And when he spoke finally... His voice was unruffled either by indignation or apprehension. No. The monosyllable was curt but complete. No, he said again, to all of your questions. This Howard Davis, with whom Miss Chipchase ran away, I began again. I haven't been able to find the smallest clue to his identity down in the town. Who was he? How long was he here? Where did Miss Chipchase meet him? No one knows. Is it an alias, do you think? They drove down to the station below instead of taking the nearest one, I understand, in your own team, yet neither the conductor nor the station agent remembers seeing them, and the train boy insists that he heard. My dear young woman, Pollocksfin had risen, his short, squat, yet straight, strong figure, as it confronted me, had something bull-like in its pugnacious solidity. I must decline to be interviewed as to the reason why a senile station agent and a drunken conductor are unable to give reliable information. Is there anything more? There was. There was much more. But I didn't say it. For a woman came in just then. She was tall, with a full, slim-waisted figure, short brown hair, and prominent eyes. "'Excuse me, Mr. Pollocksfin,' she said, looking curiously from him to me. "'It is lunchtime.' "'Miss Stemple, Miss Massey,' Pollocksfin said, and we both nodded. She didn't take to me, I could see that, but oh, how I didn't like her. "'Miss Massey will have a cup of tea with us, Martha. Tell Mrs. Chipchase, will you, and Dorothea?' We followed almost immediately on her heels. Pollocksfin and I, as she went across the hall to the dining room, such a miserable luncheon that seemed to choke us all, so constrained, so hopelessly rigid, with Mrs. Chipchase sitting as in a dream on one side, with me next to her, and at the foot of the table Miss Stemple, very straight and executive, giving orders and making table talk in her place. Dorothea Chipchase, a girl of fifteen, red-eyed and sullen-lipped opposite me, and at the head Pollocksfin, hardly speaking, yet dominating every thought and word of all four of us. It was in sheer desperation that I began to talk of myself, after Dorothea said shyly, It must be fine, being on a newspaper, almost as good as being on the stage, to go everywhere and see everything. 
"'It's the one thing in the world for me,' I answered quickly, glad of something honest and genuine I could say. "'It's a standing joke in the office, how gone I am on the profession. But I do love it. I love the local room just before each of us goes out to bag his story. I love it when we all get back at night and pencils fly over the paper and typewriters click and the telephone bells go whirring. I love it when the newspaper's gone to press and those gossips, the newspaper boys, Never women in the world were such gossips as these fellows. Get down to chinning over their pipes, to telling the truth, more truth than they've been permitted to put into their stories, to bragging how they got their tips and how they followed them up, to turning things and people inside out and letting you see the springs that move them. I even love that local room, for the chance there's in it to redeem a failure, when one comes back empty-handed after a long, hard day's work and there's Bowman to face. Bowman, he's the city editor. There's no explanation goes with Bowman of why you fell down on your assignment. You've got your story or you haven't. You've made a killing or you haven't. Don't waste time telling Bowman how the deer jumped just at the critical moment, how the gun misbehaved, that the weather was bad or any other old thing. Just lay down your weapons and throw up your hands. I did it, just once. It was my first interview, a little thing I know now, but when Bowman sent me out on it my hands were numb, cold chills ran down my back, and I kept gulping nervously to swallow the brassy taste of terror in my mouth. Talk about stage fright! And it was an actress I had to interview. Fancy! A vaudeville performer who'd made a hit with the frantic vigor of her dance. She was delighted to be interviewed, of course, but I was too green to know that. She received me in the most domestic little stage scene, made to order to impress me. But how could I know that? I was too frightened and self-conscious to use my eyes, my ears, or my tongue. I didn't have any brain. But she talked. My, how she talked. Told how she was starving when she first happened to hit upon the boom-boom style of dancing. How her manager discouraged her how she persevered, how much money she had made, the price of her dresses, what her jewels were worth, what suffering her last divorce had cost her, what happiness she had found in her latest marriage, how she happened to have one last photograph of herself that really belonged to her dear husband, but I might have it because somehow she felt we were such good friends, and so she would write her name and mine at the bottom of it, how glad she was to meet me, and how invariably she read everything I wrote, I had never signed a thing then. And when would the interview come out, and would I be sure to send her six copies? And I found myself out of the hotel, hurrying in a feverish dream toward the office, and at last entering Bowman's room with not a line written, not a word in my memory, and only the photo of an actress, of an actress whose pictures her press agent had been peddling hopelessly for weeks, for my day's work. I can hear his laugh yet, Bowman's, I can hear it, and I can feel. Quickly I felt a foot touch mine under the table. It was a warning, friendly, surreptitious, timid. I put down the glass that I had lifted to my lips, and as I did so I saw Mrs. Chipchase do precisely the same thing. But her face was miserable and humiliated, and her eyes refused to meet mine. And yet it must have been she, for Pollocksvin sat at the extreme end, she or Miss Stemple or Dorothea, who had given me warning, about what? Or was the warning not meant for me? It wasn't the housekeeper, I was sure of that. But was it Dorothea? I turned to her. And, and what happened then? she asked quickly. She did not lift her eyes to mine. She was looking at her stepmother. Oh, I had to stop and think a moment to get back to my story. Bowman just had Thompson, Ted Thompson, he was on our paper then, write a fake interview. He did it in twenty minutes, and it was delicious, funny, clever, a million times better than I could possibly have done. I cried myself to sleep that night, and oh, how I loved the sight of that dear old local room the next morning that gave me another chance. Miss Massey, the girl's voice was eager, she spoke hurriedly, taking advantage of Pollocksvin's talking to Mrs. Chipchase. "'Your work brings you into contact with all sorts of celebrated people?' "'Well, yes.' 
Perhaps. Oh, do you know Mr. David Lowenthal? The artist who's gone astray as a member of the theatrical syndicate? Why, of course. He did such a beautiful thing for a girl I know, she went on breathlessly. This girl was stage-struck, I suppose you'd call it, and she wrote him a, a foolish letter. His answer was so fine, so fatherly, so, so almost noble, she... She must have fallen in love with him from your tone, I laughed. But you're right, and that's like Lowenthal, a letter like that. Would you like to meet him? Would I? Would, she began. But just then the others rose from the table, and we all filed out into the hall, all but Pollocksfin and Mrs. Chipchase. They stayed behind. Dorothea ran up the long, broad flight of steps that led to the upper story, as I followed Miss Stemple across the hall and into the front room, and Pollocksfin called after me. "'Wait a few minutes, Miss Massey. Mrs. Chipchase will want to make the statement you asked for.' There was a note of simple, confident good nature in his voice that amazed me. If Pollocksfin said a thing like that in such a tone, it spelled defeat for Rhoda Massey. Where, where was the weak spot? In despair, I cried to myself that McCabe was sure of the story. That nerved me again to believe in it myself, and in the meantime to sit in the shaded parlor with Miss Stemple silently watching me while I waited for Mrs. Chipchase. I heard her step in the hall at last and rose. Clearly my stay in that house was over now. But just before she got to the parlor door there was a swift patter of feet down the stairs, and I heard Dorothea's voice. Mary says she won't. She won't eat a thing unless I cook. And then Miss Stemple flew to the door and slammed it as she went out behind her. For a minute I stood there alone, all a tingle with excitement. Then the door opened and Mrs. Chipchase stood on the threshold. "'Miss Massey,' she said, speaking with a mechanical tonelessness that was like a child's repetition of a lesson, "'I am grieved to hear that certain rumors derogatory to my brother, Mr. Wells Pollocksfin, are being circulated. I authorize you to deny them for me in your paper, in my name. They are false, all of them.' She bent her head and started up the stairs. And as Miss Stemple closed the hall door a moment later, shutting me out of the house of mystery, the last thing I saw was Mrs. Chipchase, then almost at the top of the staircase. She was clutching the banister as though every step was a mighty effort. And the first thing I became aware of, when I had stormed down the steps and out beyond the hedge, was Ted Thompson's smiling, clever, satisfied face. "'I should judge from your joyous manner, Miss Massey,' he said ironically, coming up and joining me, "'that you have lunched with the chip chases, that you have met wicked Miss Stemple and clever stage-struck little Dorothea, not to mention that perfect gentleman, Wells Pollocksfin, and that you are provided with a complete and circumstantial denial of the whole libelous tale, and not one line besides.' I had thought I should want to cry as soon as I was out of the house, I was so mortally blue. But Thompson was so cocksure that I couldn't resist jarring his satisfaction a bit. "'You're nearly right,' I admitted modestly. He turned quickly. "'Nearly?' "'Doesn't that content you?' He looked sharply at me. "'I don't believe you,' he said after a moment. If you had one solid fact to base a story on, you'd have flown down those steps instead of... That wouldn't have been professional. But it would have been human. I'd be capable of it myself for a Pollocksfin story, and I've had a few more years of newspaper work than you, young lady. Going to take the afternoon train back, Miss Massey? Thank you, no, Mr. Thompson. I believe I'll wait till evening. So will I, then. But look here. He got off his high horse. State your grounds, or your belief, or your hope of a Pollocksman story to me, and I'll give you my word of honor to go straight back to town and not make the least use of your tip. But just let me decide for you whether it's worth putting in your time, and your whole heart and soul, you insatiate little digger, on this forlorn hope. 
I hate to see a girl work like that. I shook my head, but I put my hand in his outstretched big one, and for the first time it occurred to me that one might really like Ted Thompson, if one were only in his class, and not a wretched little local room prodigy full of envy and ambition. I can't, I laughed. There isn't a lunatic outside asylum walls that would call it a tip, the tiny, tiny hopelet I've got, and yet I simply can't leave it. Go, leave me to my fate. Good luck, then. I didn't know women had it in them, that terrier instinct to get to earth. I don't like it. Frankly, Miss Massey, tisn't womanly, and girls with sunny hair were made. Oh, I'll be womanly to beat the band, I interrupted, after the paper's gone to press. I watched him as he swung off down the lane toward the village. It had exhilarated me just to talk with him. To be on the same story with Thompson made you feel almost like a special writer yourself, like one of the lofty, who sit in separate rooms and use individual typewriters, who reject this assignment and accept that one, and talk to Bowman in a baffling little superior way when they're so sorry they haven't time to do a certain story for him which, they intimate, is being just butchered by some incompetent, and then sit down with McCabe as man to man and find fault with the make-up of the paper, and suggest a feature or a headline, or an improvement in the artist's way of handling his part of it. Oh, I'll do it all and be it all myself some day. I looked from the poppy-decked road where I sat over to the chip-chase house. Oh, to force it to yield up the secret it held, the big, stubborn, dumb place. I couldn't, I just couldn't go back. So I stayed and stayed. And all I had, so little I had been ashamed to own it, was Dorothea's words in the hall. Mary says she won't. Then Mary Chipchase must still be in that mysterious house yonder, and the story of the elopement must be only half true, or not true at all, and I... And I felt my pulses bounding, for just then a tall, well-developed figure in a stylish coat and a picture hat came down the side steps on the south side walked across the lawn out into the lane and down toward the village. It was Miss Stemple, Miss Stemple out of the way and the door lightly shut behind her and most probably unlocked, and the way Miss Stemple came out must be the way for Rhoda Massey to get in again. I didn't give myself time to think it over. I didn't dare. It was so impudent a thing to do. But before I got to the door I had a wee lie ready for an emergency. I didn't knock. No, I pushed the door open, and softly I hurried up the narrow flight of stairs, the servant's staircase. I got to the top and stood like a guilty thing, looking down the hall and longing for something to tell me which of the two corridors branching from it was the one I wanted, when I heard a step. My heart went down to my boots. At the thought of meeting Pollocksfin, something seemed to clog within me. I might have been the sneak thief I looked and not the hardest digger on the staff of the biggest and yellowest paper in San Francisco, so unreasoningly terrified I was. But it wasn't Pollocksman. It was a housemaid, who looked surprised at the sight of me, but not amazed. I went up to her all abeam. I can be what Ted Thompson calls womanly, and just now I cared more to make friends with this big-toothed Irish girl than for Taffy from any man I'd ever met. "'Miss Stemple told me to come right up,' I began quickly. "'I met her just as she was going out. "'She said you'd show me Miss Chipchase's room. "'Which is it?' "'I said it casually. "'I really think I did, "'but there was a sound of rushing in my ears. "'I so held my breath to listen. "'And she said it. "'She said it. "'Which one?' she asked. "'Why, Mary's, of course. "'You know, we were roommates at college.' I gurgled in my relief. Dorothea's growing, though, isn't she? She nodded, leading the way without a word. It may have seemed as though I walked after her, but really I danced all the way down the broad, dark hall. And then suddenly something sent the blood to my ears again. It was the tapping of the cane. Pollocksman's cane, I knew it, planted so firmly and slowly and regularly it might measure the beating of one's heart. I couldn't face him. Not now. 
within an inch of my story, anything but that. With a finger to my lips, I slipped a dollar into the girl's hand and stepped into a big alcove at the end where the halls branched, in which, in the days of the chip chase's splendor, there must have stood a great marble statue. "'What is it?' Pollocksfin cried. He had heard the noise I made scrambling into place. "'What are you doing in this part of the house?' he demanded of the girl. She went forward and made some reply. I couldn't hear it. Pressed close. Oh, at times I'm mighty glad I'm little. With my head bent forward, I was posing as a yellow reporter frozen into a living statue of suspense. Well, get your work done in a hurry and get downstairs. Pollocksfin growled and stumped slowly past me down the stairs. You're a treasure. I whispered to the maid as the door slammed behind him. Here's another, and I opened my purse. No, keep it, and this one too, she said, trying to push the coin back into my hand. Her own was trembling. I won't bring ye to Miss Chip Chase, I'm afraid. But Miss Stemple, I objected. Let her tell me so herself. Oh, if you don't believe me. I exclaimed haughtily. Well, why then did ye hide from him? No, keep your money, I'm afraid. She turned from me and hurried down the hall. Oh, to have success so near. Listen, I said, running after her. You've got to show me which is Miss Chipchase's room. If you don't, I'll walk straight down those stairs and tell Mr. Pollocksvin you let me in. Ah! Oh, "'Ye deceitful little devil with your baby face!' she wailed aghast. I wanted to laugh, or to cry, anything except to stand still and feel the chances of discovery thicken about me. "'Nah, you're afraid of him yourself,' she said at last, taking courage at the memory of my scare. "'Not a bit of it, not a single bit of it,' I whispered positively. I'll go down to him after I've seen Miss Chipchase, if you like, and tell him you're not— The saints forbid! Oh, come on, do please, I coaxed. And suddenly she yielded. Catching me by the wrist, she almost ran with me up the corridor, and pointing to a door at the end of a narrow hall, she turned and fled. For a second I was afraid to try that door. Such jubilation was in me that, if it should happen to be locked, I knew nothing more to do but to dissolve in tears. A swish of skirts in the corridor below decided the thing for me. I just had to go in. I turned the knob and, and stepped right into the bedroom where Mary Chipchase lay. I knew her immediately. She was so like a glorified edition de luxe of little Dorothea. She started up suddenly at sight of me, then she fell back with a cry of pain. But before I had reached the bed, she put out a feverish hand that beckoned me to her. "'I know, I know,' she said swiftly under her breath. "'You're the bright-eyed little reporter girl Dorothea told me about. For mercy's sake, how did you get here? No, no, don't speak. There isn't time. Listen, it's a lie. I didn't run away with any man. It's a lie. What mother, my stepmother, told you this morning.' Wells Pollocksfin's denials are lies, lies. It's all a lie. Our whole life for years passed and since my guardian went abroad, but we lied for her, for mother. She has been a mother to us, that poor tortured woman, but if I tell you promise, swear that you'll shield her, that no one will know that part of it. You're a girl like myself. Surely you wouldn't hurt us. Oh, surely. Trust me, I gasped. She looked at me a moment. You won't tell. I know you won't. She, she drinks, poor mother. And when Wells Pollocksman wants her to do anything, he has wine served for her, as he did at lunch today, Dorothea told me, though he'd be kinder to give her poison. And that's why he kept you here to lunch, knowing that in a stranger's presence poor little Dolly wouldn't dare to protest, and could only implore mother with her eyes and try vainly to— Oh, but it's all ended now. I've been trying to wait till Mr. Newberry should come back from abroad and help us, but I can't wait any longer. I did fly from the house when Pollocksfin. He wanted to marry me. There. 
Did you ever hear anything madder than that? She broke down, laughing hysterically and crying with passion. But he didn't, he couldn't strike you. I knew now that part of it was wrong. No one could strike Mary Chipchase. Strike, strike me? Oh, no, no. He raised his cane at Mother. He often threatens her when, when she's not herself. It was in the little wood just before you get to the station. He had overtaken me in his cart and brought her along to persuade me to come back. But the brandy he had given her maddened her this time, and she cried to me to go, to go with her blessing. Then I thought he was going to strike her, and I sprang forward. But my foot slipped on the wet grass, and I sprained my ankle. She winced and closed her big dark eyes as though still suffering. It was all I could do to bear the jolting of the cart that brought me back home. I had to come then, but I drove Mother back, and he, Pollocksfin, followed on foot. I made up my mind then and told him it was the end. Then he gave out this lie about my running away with some man. He thought it would ruin my reputation, and then I might see the wisdom of becoming Mrs. Pollocksfin. Oh, fancy, fancy! He'll say I'm mad when you publish this, but the publication of it will end. What are you writing? Just a line for you to sign, if you will. I passed her a bit of copy paper and my pencil. She took it, and all at once, without a sound, the door I was facing opened. In some previous incarnation, I'm afraid a certain girl I know must have been something yellower than a newspaper woman, for it was instinct, not reason, that sent me slipping noiselessly to the floor, with the bed in front to conceal me. Mary, my pretty, pretty Mary, you are better, darling? It was Mrs. Chipchase. I couldn't see her face, but I knew what the stammer in her voice meant, and the uncertain motion with which she dropped on her knees on the other side of the bed. In misery the poor soul abased herself, flagellated her weakness and the vice that had brought her dead husband's daughter to this, begged piteously for forgiveness, yet would not be forgiven, but lay sobbing, till in sheer exhaustion she dropped asleep on her knees there, her gray head pillowed on the girl's knees. With her body held motionless by the tender weight she would not disturb, Miss Chipchase turned her head and nodded toward me. I got up. "'You must hurry,' she whispered, holding out the slip of paper to me. "'He'll miss her soon. I couldn't sign it, you see. She broke the pencil.' "'I—I'd I'd give a lot for your signature,' I stammered. "'If Dorothea were here—wait, leave it with me. If I can sign it, she may get it to you. But go now, quick.' Do you suppose when he sees it he'll be desperate enough to— She smiled bitterly. You don't know him. He's a coward underneath it all. Once exposed, he'll run away and hide, and my guardian comes back before long. Then he'll take care of Mother. Remember your promise about her. Quick, I hear his stick. She pointed to a door at the other end of the room, and out I flew. Flew? Oh, yes. I had wings. Wings of triumph that bore me so swiftly through the corridors and down the stairs that I bumped into Miss Stemple coming up. She cried out, Dorothea, you... And by the time she'd caught her breath, I was out. Out. And with my story, my dear story, the story, the Pollocksvin story, it was written, hours it took me, I was so excited, and filed with the telegraph operator, and I'd got a message from the news. Bully for you. Congratulations from the office. Signed, McCabe. When train time came. I've got it yet, that telegram. It's like wedding cake or a baby's shoe. It's so precious. And then to complete it all, as I was stepping into the car, an envelope was put into my hand. It was Mary Chipchase's authorization of the interview. I wired that down, too, at the first stop, but kept the original. We might need that, the office and I. And I was lying back in Ted Thompson's seat, too exhausted even to be happy, while the porter made up my berth, when Thompson himself came in from the smoker. Tired out, eh? he asked kindly, standing for a moment beside me. Poor little girl. Next time you'll take a more experienced fool's advice. 
Better go to bed. See you in the morning. Good night. I nodded. I couldn't speak without slopping over and telling him the whole thing. I was cold and hungry and too excited to eat or sleep. But, oh, to have beaten Ted Thompson. End of Chapter 1